Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the panel, and welcome to our live webinar on GMP expectations for products used in early phase IND studies. Uh, my name is David, and I'm going to be a host uh, for today. And on behalf of Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to say thank you to everyone for taking part in today's webinar. Um, I'm really honored to introduce to you our speaker for today's session, um, Dr. Kuhara. Now, Stephen S. Kuhara, PhD, is the founder and principal of GXP Biotechnology LLC, a consulting firm that works in the areas covered by the GLP and GMP of drugs, biologics, and nutraceuticals. Steve has over 30 years of experience in supervising quality control laboratories, including an animal testing facility, and in performing GLP and GMP audit of internal and external testing laboratories. Steve has participated in the development of drugs and biologicals through all phases of clinical research and final product uh, production. And Steve, we're really honored to have you with us today to present today's webinar. Um, now, before we begin, I would like to inform all participants of the program outlined uh, uh, for today's session. Uh, the webinar is for 60 minutes duration. First, John will take you through, this, uh, through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. Uh, we also request all to hold back your verbal questions until the Q&A session begins. However, if you'd like to uh, type in your question and send it across to, uh, to me, that'll be great. I'll pass it on to Steve during the Q&A. Um, now, if for any reason you get logged out of the training session or the teleconference, you may follow the same procedure to join in again. Um, I hope everyone is ready to start today's session. I now request uh, uh, Steve to take it from here. Steve? Thank you very much, David. Um, before we start, I'd like to apologize to all of you for the glitch I'm having. Um, it turned out I was using the wrong web browser, and now everything's mostly analyzed. Um, there is one thing here, which is that I am getting some feedback or crosstalk um, on my, my end of the line. Uh, if, I wonder if any of you are having similar problems. Oh, yes, Steve, I even have to hear a lot of notes. I, I've, I've, I've muted all the lines. Uh, uh huh. Okay. I've, all the lines are mute, but I'm not too sure where the noise is coming from. Yeah, I, it's, I'm hearing things like people talking in the background. That's correct. Know, that's correct. Kind of sound. Anyway, I guess we better get started, and hopefully I'll be able to talk over any sort of um, complications here. Um, we're going to talk about products used in early phase IND studies. And um, I have to give you the usual caveat, the um, warnings. I'm presenting material from several different, several different guidance documents. And this is for material very early um, phase one and before phase one. Um, in your development process, and I will warn you that the guidance documents that I read do not apply to all products. It's um, sort of dependent upon the situation you're in, and I hope I'll be able to uh, give you the warnings as we go along. Now, the um, early phase studies, some of these are non-clinical, and they're GLP studies. And uh, we really don't talk about GLP here, but um, others are going to be, well, depending upon how you look at it, they're, they're either phase one or they're before phase one. Um, this is in the transition phase where we're going from the non-clinical GLP studies on toxicology, pharmacokinetics, et cetera, and um, we get into this sort of a hazy area where you're doing either GLP studies on animals or you should be doing GMP studies on humans. Now, there, there's a problem here um, in that some of the, this, these uh, rules are sort of hazy and conflicting, and I blame FDA for it. Um, they have been trying to be accommodating with various companies uh, who have been having problems apparently meeting GLP regulations. And in doing this, we end up with some uh, sort of um, not really conflicting but uh, confusing situations. 
Now, early on, when you do your animal toxicology studies, all of this, these are covered by the GLPs, and there is a guidance document, which is basically a question and answer set of um, things on the content and format of INDs uh, for phase one, et cetera. This was issued by Cedar and Sieber in October of 2001. And um, it supposedly clarifies <laughs> when you should be submitting your final toxicology reports and everything. Now, these are the toxicology reports that you use in order to justify your um, your IND studies. In, in other words, what you have to do is to provide some uh, data from your preclinical studies to more or less verify that your product is safe and to give FDA some confidence uh, that you're dealing with safe products and that you can put the products into humans. Now, you have, from the time you submit the material, your IND, you don't have to submit the audited or the full study in the IND, but you're given a 120-day grace period before you have to submit the, this information, and it starts with the date of receipt stamped on the IND submission and all this. And it's kind of a weird statement here because uh, if it says that if you don't submit it, then, well, you have to submit it with the NDA, which, as you know, may be several years down the line. Now, the problem here, of course, is that during the period where you're supposed to have submitted this with your IND and the time that you really have to submit it with the NDA, if you should be inspected by um, an organization like the BIMO group, the Bio Biologics Industry Monitoring Organization, or somebody else that's looking uh, into your preclinical studies, you will be expected to provide the quality assured report. So, you know, just because you, don't, you haven't turned it in with your IND doesn't mean that you don't need to have it. Now, we then go on to another guidance for industry, and this has to do with exploratory IND uh, studies. This guidance was published in January 2006 by CEDAR, and it's intended to clarify your cl preclinical and clinical approaches and, um, you know, these other what you should consider when planning exploratory studies. Now, technically, this is not part of the GMPs. It's under uh, 312, which is the regulation that covers INDs. But there's a clear expectation that you would be doing this under GMP-like conditions. And we'll get a little bit further into this as we go on through this webinar. But here's, here's the... Uh, explore what's considered to be an exploratory IND study. Uh, it's done early in phase one, and it's before what you would normally consider to be a phase one study. You're doing limited human, human exposure, and you have no therapeutic or diagnostic intent. In other words, you're testing this um, in microdose studies or something like this, and you don't expect to actually cure the disease or to you know have doses high enough to cure the disease, and what you're looking for are is confirmation of information that you develop during your pre preclinical studies, and it's usually a short study. For instance, they say less than seven days, and the guidance is for early stages of new drugs and biologic products. Now, they give you examples of what a different exploratory IND might be like. And for instance, mechanism of action. Um, if you've seen a so-called mechanism of action in your animals, at some point it's going to be important to prove that the same mechanism works in humans. 
Now, of course, you don't start right off putting this thing into humans, so you you will um, <clears throat> you will want to work it out in animals. But then, what you may want to do is to come in with a very small dose, and usually uh, you might even use a tracer tagged material, not necessarily radioactive. You could use, for instance, deuterated material or something that a uh, positron emit emitter. And um, you put this in small doses into humans, and you can predict that if the mechanism works properly in humans, then you should see certain metabolites uh, arising. And you know you can confirm your ideas about mechanism of action. Also, you can do a pharmacokinetic study uh, with very low doses, again, looking for metabolites and things like that at low doses. You don't have to go to the full therapeutic dose at this stage. And also biodistribution characters, characteristics, uh, again, using imaging technology like PET, for instance, positron emission tomography. And the, uh, these doses and these studies are done at a very early stage before you actually put in your real uh, full IND. They are considered to be first in human studies. And so when you do your submission, your IND submission, your previous human experience will not be pertinent. And you don't need to discuss it in your IND. And um, the common theme is, bas is basically informational um, data. Your clinical data here, it's a circumscribed group and plans for future development. You see, this is your argument, that you cannot fully develop your further IND studies without the information that you would get from your uh, preclinical, I mean, the, these exploratory studies. And here's the rationale that you need. And here's, here's the point here. This IND is intended to be withdrawn after you do the preclinical, I mean, the exploratory studies. And what you do is you withdraw this IND, and then you submit a new one for your regular clinical studies. So you will have an exploratory IND, and then after that, you may file an IND for your full phase one studies. And here's the content. Uh, there's two types of studies. For instance, your uh, possible study design, your microdose studies, single administration of a small dose, or repeat dose clinical studies uh, looking for pharmacologic or pharmacodynamic endpoints. Again, remember, these are going to be very low doses. And you, you don't expect a therapeutic um, use, but um, for instance, you, you may dose um, <clears throat> volunteers, healthy volunteers, looking for uh, biodistribution within the body and all this sort of stuff. So th this is basically what you're looking at here. Here's your CMC requirements for these things. Um, you can provide the CMC information in a summary report. And um, it tells you here what to look at. Remember, this is normally covered under 21 CFR 312.23. And um, th these are the kinds of information uh, points that you need, the active ingredient, the candidate product, what your physical, chemical, biological characteristics, as well as the source, and uh, the therapeutic class that it's in, and um, <clears throat> it says see sections below. Well, the sections below will be found in the guidance document. So you should read the full guidance document. Description of dosage form, um, description of formulation, routes of administration, excipients, what excipients. You see, you're, you're actually talking about your actual product here. You're, you're not just administering an API like you might have done during the animal studies, but you're, you're actually going to be looking at your, your actual product at this point, even though it's going to be as low doses. But, you know, you should include